Hi, my name is Krista West, and this is another Avlia floss tube. And today I'm gonna to talk about my own personal stitching practice and how to get creatively unstuck. Before I begin, I just want you to know where you can find all my stuff. I am on Instagram and YouTube at Krista M. West. You can find me on Facebook at Avlia Folk Embroidery, or you can get the latest info at www.avlia.life. That's uh, my main Avlia website. If you wanna sign up for the emails, those are awesome. I only send them out maybe every seven to 10 days. Um, sometimes I only send them out twice a month. I try not to overwhelm you with emails. But today, to jump in, I wanted to show you my favorite place to stitch. Now, three years ago, my husband and I purchased a historic 1923 home that needed a lot of love. I mean, a lot. There were rats in the attic. We didn't have heat for the first month. I mean, it was, and everything was painted apartment white. It was really, really a mess. But when we first walked through the house, it was this beautiful, amazing living room that just completely, uh, here, I'm gonna turn it around and show you the living room. Oh, I think I'm going to. There we go, okay. This living room is just stunning. It's kind of funny because this living room is like this grand living room, but the rest of the house is, is really not like super fancy. The bedrooms are all normal sizes. The kitchen's normal size, dining room's normal size. This is not like a grand home. It just happens to have this really amazing grand living room, which I fell in love with. The minute we walked through this door, I was like, oh my word, I have lost my heart to this living room and I can't ever look at another house and love another house the way I'm ever gonna love this house again. So we spent this last winter actually renovating it painting, draperies, refinishing the floors, taking out the old baseboard heaters. And it is just simply my favorite place to stitch. Um, it's also where I can show off a lot of my embroideries, which is kind of fun. So for example, this is the Byzantine rose border that many of you know and love. It's both available as a regular pattern. Here it is with the little chickens. I love the little chickens, they're so cute. Um, that's a big one. That's actually a 36 by 36 inch piece that I worked in it on Legacy Linen. This is a beautiful embroidery that I actually picked up in Greece. I did not work this one. Um, a woman in Thessaloniki designed it and stitched it, and it's still, I just find it, it almost evokes like art deco to me. It's just so amazing. Um, let's see, where else? What else have we got here? Oh, I have the Byzantine Meander design, which is one of the very first designs. Here, I'll move this so you can see it a little better. The Byzantine Meander design was one of the first designs that I did on traditional ground cloth that really made me fall in love with it. So I love this room because it's kind of a fancy room. It's like I get to have really pretty things and I get to sit in here and stitch and I love the sense of space and loft in this room. It's just really incredible. So I thought you'd want to join me today. Now let me see if I can figure out how to do this. Thanks for bearing with me, you guys, because you know I'm not like, I'm such a newbie at all this like youtube -y stuff and everything. So I thought I would talk a little bit about my own stitching practice because people have asked, uh, how do you stitch? Where do you stitch? When do you stitch? So I am entirely self-taught when it comes to stitching. I think maybe when I was 10 or 11 years old, somebody showed me like counted cross stitch, but that was back in the eighties, you know, maybe we can just kind of draw a veil over that right now. So I wasn't that drawn to it because there just wasn't a lot of great designs out there at that point in time. And I just kind of forgot about it. And then about maybe 12, 14 years ago, I was in a trip to Greece. A friend showed me some of her stuff and I was like, oh my word, I had no idea that that's what counted thread work could be. And I fell in love and haven't looked back. So my whole process is entirely self-taught. Uh, I, I, I didn't even know that there were different ways to like do stitches till like I started watching other people on floss tube, which is pretty funny. But my practice is very basic. Um, my toolkit is very basic how I do it. Uh, I'll show you that in a minute. I'll start stitching something in just a minute. But just to answer some of the other questions, um, when I stitch, I actually stitch anywhere from two to five hours a day. Now, I know you're like, what? I'm like, yes, I do stitch. If I can manage it, I stitch both in the afternoons and in the evenings. I always stitch when I'm watching TV because I don't sit still very well. I've mentioned that in previous podcasts, previous videos. Um, I am on the autism spectrum. And so I need that, uh, I need to be able to be using my hands to basically calm my mind and to keep my brain from, I don't know, blowing up, I guess. So anyways, so 
I stitch a lot and that was actually sort of what led me to like start doing Avlia is I realized that my family didn't really need like 40 or 50 like embroideries that I needed to start sharing these with the world because I stitch probably, I mean, some months, it's not uncommon for me to stitch 10,000 stitches in a month. So I have a lot of time to stitch and I devote a lot of time to stitching because it's very meditative and very therapeutic for me. Now, if I can, I stitch in the afternoon for an hour to an hour and a half. And then I stitch again in the evening for probably a couple of hours. Um, sometimes in the afternoon, if I can manage it and get like a good two or three hour session in, that's like awesome. So increasingly now with doing more design work and stuff like that, I don't always stitch in the afternoons, but I always stitch in the evenings. So I'm stitching again, usually most days, a minimum of two hours a day. So where I stitch, I stitch in the winter time, I stitch in my living room. Um, in the evenings, we have, a, we have a little tiny TV room and I just move my stuff in there and I stitch in the evening in there. And then in the summer, when it's nice out, I love to also stitch on my front porch where I can like look out and see the trees or in my backyard, same idea. I love to stitch in nature. Like, I just feel like that's awesome. Like occasionally like when we go camping or something like that and I can take my stitching with me and just be stitching in nature, I just feel like that's so amazing and awesome. Now, many of you have seen my other video on meditative stitching, and I wanted to just kind of walk you through sort of what that looks like for me with my stitching practice. Now, you notice I'm using the word practice. You're like, well, it feels a little weird to say that, but we have this word in Greek called praxis, and it basically just means practice, like a lawyer practices law or a dentist practices dentistry. Well, I like to think of my stitching as a type of practice because I'm at it every day. I feel like I'm constantly improving, um, and it's something that's really important to me as a part of my daily life. So, and it has a very meditative quality for me. I need that calm. So I thought I would just start and stitch a little bit and show you, because several people have asked me like, how do you start and how do you stop? Now I have my work in my Lowry frame right now. I'll talk about that in just a second, but I'm gonna start and show you a couple of things that I do. Now, oh, I went to grab for my phone, but I'm videoing on my phone, so can't do that. But the very first thing I do when I'm stitching, actually, and this is, how, this is just a newbie trick for those of you who haven't figured this out yet, if you don't have a ruler app on your phone, oh my word, they're awesome. Get one for your phone. There's a bunch of free ones. And what I do, what I start by doing, like you can see this is a brand new design and I apologize, it is yellow on cream. So it's a little tough to see this. But what I do is I take my ruler on my phone and I measure out however far the pattern says. And this pattern is three inches over from each corner or three inches in from each side. And then what I do is I take a little bit of floss and I just pull it through and I mark that so that I know that's my starting point of the corner. Now, if I do that for a design like this, this is the design I'm working on. And you notice that here is the starting point of the design, but the first stitch isn't taken until nine stitches over, nine stitches diagonally down. So this is where I put that little piece of floss and that way I know, okay, this is where I'm supposed to go. This is where the outside of the pattern is that will line up with this row, these little guys here, and that will line up with these little guys here. And then I'm gonna start in right there where I need to start. Now, when I start, I just hoop up. Um, I really love Hardwick Manor hoops. They're, they're just beautiful. And I really like with my stitching, like. I've done Q-snaps and things like that before, but part of it, I just don't really like plastic. Um, my kids tease me about it. Like, I don't have plastic Tupperware. I put everything in mason jars in the fridge and everything. I just don't like the aesthetic of plastic. And so I try to keep as little plastic in my stitching as possible. And in fact, like I am just, I tell you right now, one of my big projects I'm working on is trying to figure out how to do something different than the plastic bags that we that we send kits out in because I really wish there was like a more beautiful option. I'm thinking about it, so give me time. So now here I've threaded my needle with my floss. I tend to like my floss pretty long. I tend to work with almost a full yard because I don't like to start and stop too often. So here I'm just gonna go ahead, I've got it here and I'm gonna go ahead and just start where I'm going. Oh, whoops, forgot to do the other thing that I do, my Mr. Rogers switching of the glasses. So I set down my regular ones and I pick up my super triple magnifiers. If you wear glasses for stitching, 
take your embroidery in when you have your optometry appointment and show your optometrist how you're embroidering. This is important because some people hold their embroidery out a little farther, some a little closer. And if you wear glasses, your optometrist needs to know how far out you hold your embroidery because it changes the focal distance. Once I did this, oh, I just revolutionized like the kind of glasses I wear for embroidery and I have no eye fatigue whatsoever and haven't for the last like decade once I figured this out. I had a really lovely optometrist who kind of like said, yeah, bring in your embroidery, show me how, what you're doing. And that was really helpful. So when I start, I'm just starting like this. I'm pulling my floss through and I pull through till I have about an inch on the back side. I hold it with one of my fingers. I take a couple of stitches. Let me see if I can get going here. Just to basically hold that in place. So for me, I usually take like two or even three stitches. I, in all the time that I have been embroidering, I have simply never had threads come out of the back. So, I don't know, is that a big problem for people? So basically, I just have that there, and you can see that. I'm gonna put that up pretty close, okay? I just basically hold that down. And now I'm gonna stitch. Now, when I first start stitching, I tend to start with whatever area of the design, even if it's just like, when I say when I start stitching, I mean like for that day. I sit down and I try to pick the part of the design either that I'm already kind of in a rhythm going with, or if I'm starting a new section, the part that's the easiest at the first. So this might be like a straight line of stitches, which is what I'm using right now on this one. And I just start stitching. And when I first start stitching, I just kind of wait till my breathing settles. And you can feel that when you stitch. Those of you who know who stitch enough and know what I'm talking about. After a few minutes, your breathing is gonna like, oh. in fact, you can even hear yourself sometimes like make that kind of long exhal exhalation. For me, that usually comes about five to 10 minutes in and I'm like, okay, now I'm settled into my stitching, five to 10 minutes in. Now at this point in time, I really sort of just decide what kind of stitching session I want. Now, some sessions, I do want a full-on meditative stitching session. Say I have a problem I'm working through, or I have something I just wanna think about, or someone who I just wanna send good thoughts towards. Um, this design is a great example of that because this design is actually going to be the first Prika piece, the first uh, hope chest piece that I am making for my soon to arrive granddaughter. So this design, I wanna start this session with just thinking really awesome thoughts about her coming into the world and about the kind of person she's gonna be. And I'm just sending her lots of love, you know, in these stitches, I'm just thinking about, um, the future, I'm thinking about her and um, what it's gonna be like. She's gonna be my first grandchild, so it's really exciting phase in my life too. And so I'm just stitching and I'm thinking of her. Now, sometimes I might have a work puzzle or like a design, I might be needing some time to just sit and puzzle through a different design that I'm working on. Um, later on, like if I've been thinking about her for a while, I might switch and be like, okay, now I'm gonna think about the colorway that's really perplexing me on a lattice design that I'm working on, which I actually am working on right now. It's in the basement studio. And that's really perplexing me. And I'm just gonna kind of let my mind wander and just see what comes up. And sometimes I'll be sitting here and I'll have a little mini revelation. And it'll be like, oh, I should try that color. Oh, I should try this color. This hasn't occurred to me. What that is actually when you're stitching and you're kind of into it and you're, and you're, and you're a few minutes in, half an hour in, and you start recognizing that your brain starts making connections Okay, that's called the default mode network of your brain. And what it is, is it's this entire, like almost like awesome secretary that lives in your brain. And when your regular executive function, your, your kind of frontal lobe processing and problem solving, all that kind of goes offline when you stitch or when you do any kind of active rest, this can happen in a lot of different ways, you suddenly that default mode network comes on and it like files things and makes connections and does a really sort of deeper level of problem solving. And that's one of the things I love the most about stitching is that I can be sitting here and for example, 
when I was working on the original design of our hand kits, our little hand kit, the hand embroidery kits in the hoop, the Pennsylvania Posy and the Byzantine Acanthus, I was really struggling for weeks to figure out how to package them in a way that involved no plastic and that was totally sustainable. That was really important to me. And I poured over websites and poured over Pinterest and I would do all this research and nothing came to me. So finally one day I just was stitching and I wasn't even like thinking about it and suddenly bing, into my head comes like the perfect way to package them and, and put them together to meet all of my criteria. And it literally just came in because that default mode network came on and I was able to suddenly um, make these deeper level connections in my brain. So this is one of the reasons that I think handcraft is so needed today. We need to give our brains a break. But for many of us, that's really difficult to just like sit in a chair and you know, um, you know, I'm not really going to do that to be perfectly honest because I like having my hands busy and it helps me think when my hands are moving in this rhythmic fashion. So the default mode network is one of the greatest benefits of handwork and having some sort of active rest or some sort of hobby like this. A lot of people feel like this is sort of like a time waster, but I'm actually here to tell you that I notice a definite decrease in my creativity if my stitching time goes down. So if I have a week where I've been incredibly busy and I don't get that, you know, I get no afternoon stitching sessions and I'm getting in maybe an hour and a half at night, my creativity starts fading because I don't have that time for my brain to make these amazing connections. So that's one really great thing about stitching. So moving along. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about um, the other things that I do when I'm stitching. So sometimes, like I mentioned, I'm doing something kind of straight up meditative. And sometimes I'm going to have my headphones, my trusty little wireless headphones on like this and I'm gonna pop those in and have those on, and I will put on um, like waterfall music or something like that if I really need a really like a big dose of peacefulness. But a lot of times for me, once I've kind of done that initial little sort of 20 to 30 minute kind of intro into my stitching session, I will pop on an audiobook. I am a huge reader, I love to read, but almost all of my reading is actually done through audiobooks because I can stitch and I can learn. And I love that aspect of it. So it's kind of a twofer, you know? So I listen to a lot of audiobooks when I read. I actually just finished reading um, The Professor and the Madman about the development of the Oxford English Dictionary. It's a fascinating story, really fascinating story. And really kind of a tragic one too, but very interesting. And then I might mix in a fictional work um, and listen to something like that. And so I mix that up. Now, so that's another thing that I do. So sometimes it's a little bit of med more meditative stitching. Sometimes I'm actually directing my stitching towards another person, like thinking good thoughts and sending love to another person. And sometimes I'm, I'm learning, I'm listening to audiobooks. Once in a blue moon, I will binge watch Netflix. But I do tend to find that that doesn't leave me kind of as in, in as positive a frame of mind as like listening to an audiobook. And again, if I've had a really, really busy week and I'm like, wow, I, my brain just totally needs a break, you bet, I'll binge watch, you bet, with the best of them. But I do try to stay more towards the audiobooks and podcast side of things because I really like feeding my brain while I'm like working on my stitching. Now, I'm gonna talk just a smidge about my Lowry frame and then we'll um, wrap up with my way to get creatively unblocked. So I, over the last few years, have had um, issues, I'm getting older, and I've had issues with trigger finger. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's a swelling of the tendons in your finger. And so I've had to switch to using a, a, a Lowry work stand. Now, for those of you who've never seen one, okay, my little angle of my video is not gonna help very much on this, but it's basically this metal stand. They are definitely more expensive um, as stands go. And I have tried every, kind of stand out there. I've tried a sit stand, I've tried a lap stand, I've tried the ones where you snap the Q frames and the Q snaps into it. Everything, once I found the Lowry, it was like no looking back. I love this stand. Partly why I like it is it's very, very easy to adjust 
And I also like the fact that I can put my Hardwick Manor hoop in it. I don't have to stitch with plastic. So the thing I also like about the stand is that it allows me to mix up how I'm using my hands. Because I've been dealing with trigger finger in my right hand, I've had to teach myself to embroider with my left hand. And so what the Lowry frame allows me to do is it allows me the flexibility to basically draw up with my right and draw down with my left. Okay, that's one variation that I can do. Like that, okay. I can also, if my hand is really bad that day, I can also be stitching entirely with my left hand. Now, I'm much slower with my left hand, but the Lowry frame allows me to be able to do that entirely left-handed if I need to. Then I can also mix it up the opposite way. I can draw with my left and I draw up with my left and draw down with my right. And sometimes if I'm gonna be doing that, then I flip the frame to the other side of me. That's the other thing I really like about the frame. You can work it from the right or from the left and it's really fantastic. Um, Lately, my finger has been really bad. So this has basically kept me in this stand is what's keeping me stitching right now, which is pretty awesome. So I'm very grateful for it. I love how high quality it is and that it is very, very adjustable and that you can pretty much put any kind of hoop into it. So this is me just working at my stand. Now, that's kind of, oh, and then the other thing I like about the Lowry is that it ha it's metal. So you can magnet your chart to the stand. You can hear me, oh, sometimes it makes a clunky noise. So I'm magneting my, and I like the fact that my chart is right there, magneted right on there. So I, as I'm working, I'm watching here. And I really like that part too. The Lowry also goes up and down. It's got like an 18 inch range up and down, which is pretty amazing for a stand. So it fits around like any chair, if you're working on a couch, if you want to work closer, you want it lower. It's a really awesome stand really great for preventing hand fatigue because again i can work like what i typically will do is work maybe 10 maybe one thread's worth i'll work uh, one thread length work with drawing up with my right down with my left and then i'll switch and then sometimes i'll do my little stretches and i'll do all this kind of stuff i really want to be in the stitching game long term like into my 80s if i can manage it so it's important to me to learn how to manage hand fatigue so that's my stitching practice not really complicated, but for those of you who have asked. Now, to finish up this one, I wanna talk a little bit about how to get creatively unstuck because I had a very creatively challenging weekend and I had to sort of stop and think through what was my process for getting unstuck. So here's what happened. I um, have been super excited that everyone is like starting to find all Leah patterns. It's been awesome because it's kind of allowed me to go off the deep end and become like a total embroidery designer. And I have in process no less than about 20 different designs right now that I'm working on. And I'll work on different ones at different times. I had four of them basically at the point where the design was finished and they're ready to go to my lovely sample stitchers. And so that for that, um, I have to make sure that all the colorways are correct, that all the floss colors that I'm choosing are right for the design. So I had four of them going, which was probably stupid to begin with that I had four of them going all at one time. I shouldn't have done that. And I got super overwhelmed. And I literally was just like, oh, I'm just never gonna manage to be an embroidery designer. I'm terrible at this. And I had this like really mopey weekend, okay? So just so you know, like happens to me too. And this morning I woke up and I'm like, okay, I just have to get creatively unstuck. And I started thinking through what my process was to get creatively unstuck. So I thought I'd share that with you because I have a very clear process of how I get unstuck when I'm stuck. So let's talk about this. Now, I decided to give my little process color names because I thought this would be fun. And I call it the red, green, blue, gold method of getting unstuck. So the first one is red. The first thing you do is stop. Think about red like a stop sign. You stop and you step away from the work. So I took all the designs I was working on, I folded them over so I could not see anything. I put all the patterns underneath the fabric so I couldn't see anything. I lined them all up on my little desk and I was like, okay, everybody's going to bed. Krista, step away from the embroidery designing. So that was the first thing I did, step away from the work. And I knew that, I, and for me, 
The stepping away process can be anywhere from like two to 48 hours, but step away. First one, red, step away. Second one, and I have a prop, is green. Nature, get out into nature. That's the next thing I always do. And this for me means I either go out and take a walk or I ride my bike because that is one of the most awesome ways for me to cleanse my mind of like all my creative stuckness, okay? So nature, nature, nature. It's actually called green mind. It's like a thing. You can like read books on this. It's a thing, but green mind. And many, many famous artists, part of their daily practice included walking. And many of them will talk about how the walk is critical for the creative work. This one's huge. So green, okay. So we have red for stopping, green for getting out in nature. Now the next one, you're gonna love the prop on this one. Blue, ta-da! You're like, what? Okay, so blue is water. Now blue is blue mind, okay? So we have green, green mind, that's great. But there's actually a book called Blue Mind and it's all about water. Now for me, my creative process is integrally linked with water. I swim most days. Um, I love water. I grew up swimming. I just love to be in the water. And especially as a person who's neurodiverse, water really helps me. Uh, it gives me a really helpful sensory deprivation experience that's, I need it on a pretty much an almost daily basis. So it's very helpful for me. So, but I have my little, okay. But this is basically, if you can't get to a pool, then these little foot soak tubs are like $11 on Amazon and they're awesome. So like it, it, I use these all summer long when like if I was working through something I wanted to get a little bit of blue mind, I would, you can just fill this up and put your feet in it and that's easy too. Or you can hop in the shower. Um, that's great too. But water for me completely replenishes my creative stores. And then gold is the last one. Now gold's kind of a little bit more high concept and I don't have a prop. But gold is the color that I associate with gratitude. And that's the last part of the process to get creatively unstuck, is to sit and think about all the things that you are grateful for. And not necessarily even surrounding the creativity, although that's helpful. So I had to basically step back and say, wait a second, I'm grateful that I just get to be doing embroidery design work. And I'm grateful that I got a new shipment of DMC floss cones and that's part of what's like totally melting me down and freaking me out is I have more colors in my palette. But I'm grateful for that because that's gonna be an awesome thing. And I am grateful for my amazing husband who sat and listened to me moan about these colorways for probably like 30 minutes yesterday, which, you know, that strains a marriage, I'm just saying. And so I'm really, really grateful that he's an incredibly amazing listener and he always listens when I need to like creatively process something verbally, which is a lot. So, and I'm grateful that like I can live this life of creativity and then I can do this. And usually when I follow those four steps, I stop and step away. I get my green mind going on. I get my blue mind going on to replenish. And then I think about all those golden things in my life, all those things that I'm grateful for, um, all those beautiful and precious things in my life. Then I feel like, okay, that for me totally gets me creatively unstuck. I don't know if that will help you, but maybe it will. So I wanna thank you for joining me today. I'm gonna do my little Mr. Rogers thing so I can actually see you because like the triple magnifiers are a big deal. Put my other glasses on, there we are. I wanna thank you for joining me. Um, it's a joy and a delight to share my stitching world with you. I'm Krista West of Avlia Folk Embroidery, and you can find me at www.avlia.life. Thank you and happy stitching!